I'd like to welcome on test. I'd like to welcome on stage uh, our next speaker, the CEO of Gift, somebody whose product I use daily, um, Vinny Lingham. Okay, which one's up? Which, which one push? Which one? Push cut. Which one? Hello. Hi everyone. Whoa. Hello. Cool. So uh this is very loud. Volume, volume. Thanks. Um so yeah, so you know, th this is being the distributed ledger conference. Uh, I figured, well, let's you know, let's talk about what we're doing uh, at Gift to to change the industry, um, because at the end of the day, what Gift is, it's a gift card company. We sell gift cards digitally. We allow you to upload and store your plastic gift cards. We you know, we, we dabble in the um, in the digital realm, and we, we're one of the pioneers of that. And uh, you know, we basically looked at the blockchain as being. You know, a very interesting decentralization of what our industry is. So if you think of what a gift card is, it's just a promise to pay a merchant, uh, you know, or, or a promise for a merchant to deliver goods to you. So if you give Starbucks $100, um, they have a ledger balance saying that they owe $100 against this particular card. And every time you go back and make a purchase, there's a debit against that. So it's a very simple, gift card's a very simple ledgering system. And it's linked to one simple one merchant, you know, it's, it's a one-to-one -one relationship. It's not like a Visa or MasterCard, which is, which is open loop card. It's closed loop. So, um, um, while they while they're fixing that up, um, so we, you know, we good. Okay. So I want to talk about the the Starbucks story. So I think a lot of you know this already. Um, Starbucks actually launched their first reloadable prepaid card, uh, which was meant to be a p convenient payment method and also used for gifting, back in November 2001. And within, uh, it was in eight, nine months, they sold four million cards uh, that were activated. And 75% of those cards are being used by the original purchaser, which is consistent with what we're seeing today at Gift. You know, that between 70 and 80% of our cards we sell are being used by the people that bought it from us. It's not being used for gifting. So call it one in four cards are re-gifted or gifted to a friend, but three quarters are being used by uh, individuals. So people like the idea of using prepaid cards to balance their budgets. Uh, you know, if you know you only want to spend 100 bucks a month at Starbucks, you buy a hundred dollar card and you, you'll use that up during the course of the month. So prepaid cards have become a really effective budgeting tool, gifting tool, saving tool. Kids, uh, for example, we see kids buying $50 Best Buy cards every month until they've got 500 bucks and they go buy a PS4. So, so uh, you know, the prepaid market has really changed a lot in the past uh, 10, 15 years, especially with, you know, people not wanting to use credit cards as much, uh, et cetera. And so, gift card, the gift card is a mobile app. So, back in 2009, um, Starbucks was working on this, this app. And it essentially, it, allow, it took the, 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 the gift card that you load up into your app and it digitizes. And I, I know most of you probably do this already, but it creates a barcode and you can now scan and pay at Starbucks using a mobile app. And that QR code represents the underlying plastic code that you, you received previously, but now it's in digital form. And uh, I think uh, last year there was $1.6 billion, uh, sorry, since it's launched, uh, $1.6 billion has been sp have been spent in the U.S. via the smartphone and that's 12 million purchases. So in five years, uh, it's probably the most successful um, mobile payment um, product so far. I think Apple Pay's just come out now. But uh, based on the stats we have, it's, it's been amazing. So just to give you a sense of the size of the industry, it's a $124 billion industry in the US. Uh, people, you know, all of people who receive a gift card, 65% of them spend uh, up to 38% more than what's in the face value. So it's a big revenue driver for merchants. So we launched in 2012. We, based, we have a, a great app that allows you to upload your cards, spend, uh, spend your gift card balances, buy from us. We were, we were the first company, uh, I think, we were the first gift card company, one of the first companies started accepting Bitcoin uh, back in 2013. And what we did was we, we basically gave back the credit card fee, so 3% back on all your purchases. So if you're going to buy shop at any one of our 300 stores and you just want to buy a gift card for that store in Bitcoin, we give you 3% back in points. This month, we're running promotion. It's coin month, August, so we're giving 5% back. But we're the largest seller of gift cards um, uh, on the internet for Bitcoin. And so, um, you know, we really see this as, as a bit of a last mile currency. 
So when we, in, you know, it's kind of funny. As a startup, we just, you know, I was into Bitcoin and had a whole team of, you know, 12 people in the company. When I said we're adding Bitcoin in, I think it was uh, March of 2013, everyone in the company thought I was nuts. I mean, I had to go and, uh, like a CEO founder, I've got to go and fight with everyone to get Bitcoin in because no one believed it would take off. I had to take bets with my engineers that it would, and some of them hadn't even heard of Bitcoin. And uh, eventually, you know, we launched it. It was actually pretty successful. And as a startup, you, you die for one article on TechCrunch, right? So, you, you know, you're a six-month-old company. You just want to get mentioned in TechCrunch. The day we launched it, we had two articles on TechCrunch. It was kind of crazy just because of the allure of, like, you can now spend Bitcoins physically in 55,000 stores at that point. Literally walk in, spend your Bitcoins on a gift card, and scan your phone at a point of sale. So we really opened up a whole world of, uh, and since then we're doing, you know, we're doing uh, eight figures a year in, in, in Bitcoin sales. So it, it's a pretty big business for us. We also have a, um, a digital gift card program for merchants. So at the point of sale, Clo so we were acquired by a company called First Data, which owns Clover, uh, and that's a Clover terminal. But now if, you have, if you're a merchant and you have a Clover terminal, you're able to issue gift cards powered by Gift as well. And the reason I'm telling you this is uh, we, we basically built a platform on the back of Bitcoin uh, to power digital gift cards. And so we, we, we looked at the whole gift card and digital currency space. Obviously, Starbucks has pioneered a lot of that. Uh, and we, we looked at how the, how the market's evolving, where, where gift cards are now digital currency. And so the blockchain itself allows us to create the ledger for that digital currency, for that merchant-issued currency. So when we look at the future, we launched Gift Block, uh, well, we announced it uh, about two or three months ago, I think it was in June. And what really is, is, is saying, okay, instead of storing all this gift card data, so here's an example. If you're a merchant, you're probably using someone in the industry to store uh, your, your gift card data, how many cards you've issued, what the, what the numbers are on those cards, what the balances are, and every time there's a transaction, it goes into the platform and there's a, a you know, debit uh, against the, the balances. When you want, if you want to switch providers, you can't really do that. It's very hard because the guy who owns your data won't, the, the, the service provider who owns your data won't let you switch. If you're a consumer and you try getting a balance on a gift card, it's really, really hard. You have to go to the website of potentially even the provider's website. You have to try and phone a number. For most companies, it's really, really hard to get balanced data because the merchants get charged currently every single time you check your balance on your gift card. It's kind of a stupid model. It doesn't, it's, it's one API call that costs a fraction of a cent, but 20 years ago, when the companies had data infrastructure and they were charging their merchants, they started make charging whatever, a penny a call or 10 cents a call, whatever it is, and those fees started adding up. So merchants are not incentivized to tell you easily what the balance on your gift cards are. Um, so anyway, so what we said is, well, why don't we just, why don't we just take this ledger, because that's not what the value of this whole business is. The, the value of the business doesn't lie in holding, your, holding the, the, the transaction data, the balance data ransom. The value is making sure that you know, merchants can issue gift cards to consumers, consumers have a great experience, they want to use gift cards more and more. So we said, okay, why not make the information you know, public, I mean, obviously you know, encrypted, but make, put it public in the blockchain so if a consumer wanted to switch from you know, one uh, player to another or a merchant wanted to switch, they could, and it's stored securely on the blockchain. So the key challenges we have in the industry is security. Um, you know, when, a, when a code is printed on a card, it's static. So there's a lot of gift card fraud. I mean, there was an article I read where there's about $400 million a year just, just in Q4 alone on gift card data that's stolen. So when you go into a, you know, a, a, a drugstore and you buy a gift card, there's a good chance that gift card code was captured by a store clerk. He took a photo of it, whatever. He has that code now. And then they actually go and stockpile these codes and they run scripts in the background to check when the balances are added. So when you activate the card at the point of sale and you walk out of the store, you know, someone somewhere in some bedroom is busy checking to see that the balance is added. They spend it. You give the card to your friend. He doesn't use it for three months. The money's gone by the time he sees it. So this is the sort of fraud that's in the industry. Because gift card codes are printed and physical, they're subject to being stolen. And even though you have that little scratch, that silver thing, people ignore it, they miss it. And quite frankly, when Graham grandparents are buying gift cards for their grandkids, they don't even look at that stuff. They just, you know, give me 25 or 50 or 100 bucks, I'm going to slip it into the Christmas card. And, and so there's a lot of gift card fraud there. Uh, we have interoperability problems where, you know, if we want to transfer, uh, you know, a gift card from the gift wallet to Google wallet or to uh, any other type of wallet out there, we, we, all the wallet companies, we don't agree on a single set of standards for gift cards. And this is, 
I mean, for a $125 billion industry, this is a big problem. Um, and then obviously, just the flexibility of customer amounts, exchanging cards, topping up balances. So, you know, it's well, one of the things that we're, we're working on is obviously using the blockchain. You can have um, static uh, shared secret codes and you can move things around. I don't get the cryptography of it, but as you know, using Bitcoin, we can ensure that the, when a code is generated, it's like a multi-factor authentication, so we can issue a new code every 30 seconds. And so if you're moving the codes around digitally, um, they won't be compromised. You can spend 50 bucks on a gift card, give it to a friend, and then the code he gets is different. You know, and, and so that's one way of us um, ensuring that the, the, there is security in, in, this, in, in the gift card space. And obviously there's multiple points of failure here. So when you, you have a processor which creates a gift card, you have a distributor which is basically like gift. We sell the gift cards or, or the drugstore. You have resellers as well. Um, you have the gift buyer and then you have the gift receiver. So there's multiple points of failure where these codes get shared. And if, if you can't secure it and secure it digitally, uh, there's, there's a lot of opportunity for fraud there. And then there's things like asset swaps which, um, you know, Basically, what you're doing is you're swapping bank money for merchant money. So I'm giving $100 from my banking account for $100 uh, on a Starbucks card. Um, and, and so there's obviously there's a settlement process that it goes through as well. And, and there's, 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 there are ways to make that easier using Bitcoin in the future, which what some of the things we're working on is how do you do um, counterparty, how do you do asset exchanges using the blockchain? Skip that one. That's a bit technical. Um, so device interoperability as well, like making sure that the, these things work on any device, any operating system, NSC barcodes, etc., cetera, is, is one of the keys to making sure that this you can create a global currency on the back of Bitcoin. Now, it sounds kind of counterintuitive. Isn't Bitcoin a currency? Well, again, we're looking at this as it's a ledger. Can we create currency on top of it? Can we create fungible currency? So is $100 for Starbucks on the blockchain worth $100 on a plastic card? And the answer is yes. Okay, if it's digital and it works versus plastic and it works, it's got the same value. So th th there's a couple of constraints right now with the plastic gift card world. And it's really hard to do um, things like uh, coupon payments, um, rewards as well. So when you, when you go into, so think of this, when you, go to, when you pay with a credit card and you go into a store and you're trying to do things like card-linked offers, you're trying to combine your points, a coupon, and your, and your, um, your credit card balance, it's actually a pool. So, so the company has to go, to go, the process is going to into your bank account, check the funds available, pull the money, and then make sure it reconciles with the amounts that you, you gave in terms of like, you know, a coupon or rewards points program. It's really hard if one of those things fails. because. Then how much did you pull from the bank account? Was it enough? Do you have to reverse the transaction? It's actually quite a problem. And so the, the solution that we're working on is moving to um, a push scenario where you basically, because the asset's sitting on the blockchain, you can essentially push the money, you can push the rewards, you can push the coupons into the point of sale all in one transaction, which is, which is not the way the current networks operate today. So... We think that there's a new type of gift card ledger that's out there. We're trying to make it open and public so that lots of companies can contribute to it. It effectively becomes somewhat of a, a, a side chain operating on the, you know, we look at it as like a federated, uh, federated side chain model where you can have lots of uh, chains, gift card chains being used on the blockchain and you can do asset swaps between the blockchain and uh, the Bitcoin blockchain and whatever chain's being used. But the idea that, that, that a gift card ledger doesn't belong in a black box in a room with one company controlling all the merchant data is, is kind of what we're pushing with, with the gift lock program. And that gives you a sense of, sorry, I know these slides are really far, so <laughs> I feel bad because I don't know if you guys can see it from the back. But um, that's kind of the, the ecosystem and how it moves across from merchants, aggregators to customers, et cetera. And then there's application layers you can build on top of that. Um, we're working with Chain.com on uh, moving these prepaid assets to the blockchain, and we think that there's a lot of opportunity to, you know, create federated chains, interlinked chains around uh, asset swaps, around merchant currency. So that's kind of what we're doing, in, in, you know, in terms of using Bitcoin as a ledger. Um, I, I'd love to answer any questions that you guys have uh, on that.
Um, we're trying, yes, in the future, yes. I think it's more important that we open source what we're doing so other companies can use it. Yes, we are. Yes. No, no, we're using open assets first. We, so, so chain, uh, we're using chain.com open assets and, and our own protocol we're building. No, no our own, well, our own. So we're, gonna, we're customizing it for our own devices. It's not a protocol, it's more of a, it's, it's our own software. So what's, inter I mean, what's interesting about, about this notion of using, so my, my whole thing on, on Bitcoin is that I think Bitcoin needs to be, uh, needs to gain industrial use cases. So, you know, if you think about gold and platinum, people compare Bitcoin to, to um, gold very often. And it's actually not quite true because gold is something which, as the price rises, for example, there's more gold in the world. And you, you ask, well, how is that possible? Well, there's a lot of mines out there that don't operate because the price of gold doesn't hit a certain point, doesn't hit 2,000, 2,500. And though at that point, those mines are profitable and they can open up. Uh, so, so Bitcoin is one of those things where the supply is fixed. There's only 21 million coins that will ever be mined. But the problem we have right now is that no one's really using those coins. There's no industry that needs Bitcoin to survive right now. No, there's no industry out there that if Bitcoin disappeared tomorrow, I mean, there's obviously small industry, but no large industries that requires a certain number of Bitcoins every single year. But yet every single month and every year, we're pulling out 1.2 million Bitcoins um, are being mined. And what's happening with them? Basically, speculators are going in, buying coins based upon the future value they expect, but there's no industrial use cases for Bitcoin right now. And so what GIFT is doing is we're trying to say, well, could our industry use this? And if we did this, how many Bitcoins would our industry consume? The numbers we got to was somewhere between one and two million coins. If the entire 160, I think 124 billion in the US, I think it's about $300 billion worldwide in prepaid assets, if they were moved to the blockchain, we would require one to two million coins out of 21 million for our industry to, to survive. And that creates industrial demand. So let's look at the platinum market. Platinum thrives in the fact that vehicles require catalytic converters. And so the platinum price actually has a, it has a, 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 a flaw. It, it can't drop below a certain price because there's industries that require a certain volume of, of, of platinum to produce every single year. With gold, that's not the case. Gold doesn't have the same sort of industrial demand that platinum has. So I look at Bitcoin more as, as something which is we hope to be like platinum where there's enough I mean, you think about it this way. If we're producing 1.2 million Bitcoins a year currently, and there was demand for 1.4, there's a shortage. And now the price of Bitcoin has to obviously adjust for that. Right now, we're producing 1.2 million Bitcoins a year, and it'll drop down to you know, 600,000 going forward. But there is no industrial demand for these Bitcoins, not at, not at scale anyway. And so speculators are holding the coins, waiting for it to just move up in price, but it's just not going anywhere. It's very stubborn. I mean, what, what do you do with the Bitcoins, right? What do you do with them? And that's the issue that we have. And so that's why we're trying to figure out how can we use it in industry to, um, to contribute partially to the Bitcoin ecosystem, but also change things, make them more efficient, et cetera. And where are the industrial use cases for Bitcoin? We don't right now. Um, I think we will in future. Question, there, sorry. But even if people accept the Bitcoin, it doesn't, it doesn't mean, that, so here's the problem, it's a buy and sell. What happens is with, with, with the entire Bitcoin ecosystem right now, when the moment, even money transmission from one place to another and remittances, there's a buy on the one end, there's a sell on the other end, the net effect is zero on Bitcoin. There is no use of that Bitcoin in industry. It's not being taken out of the system, it's being recirculated. And this is the problem with the current Bitcoin industry right now in the remittances market and people trying all this money transfer stuff and, and I mean, there's a whole bunch of legal issues around it, but that's, that aside, it's just in and out. But if you can remove Bitcoin from the, from the, um, the pool of Bitcoins, I mean, look, let's talk about the, the Bitcoin ecosystem right now. We've got about 14 million Bitcoins uh, out there. The, the untouched Bitcoin's about 
okay? Those are Bitcoins which are either lost, not moving, whatever the case is. Um, so that's about, you know, 5.6 million Bitcoins. You take the other uh, 8.4 million Bitcoins, that's really the free float of Bitcoins out there right now, and that's increasing by a rate of 1.2 million a year, okay? So that's about a... Uh, 16%, 15-16% inflation rate. So Bitcoin is inflating right now this year by 16%. It's going to drop. It's going to drop to about 8% next year. I mean, the, the headline inflation rates are much lower because you, you're using the full base. But the bottom line is 40% on moving. We don't even know what. We don't know whether they're lost, they're stolen, missing. Satoshi, what happened to him? Like no one knows, right? So you've got to look at what the free float is. And so there's there's an excess supply of bitcoins in the market right now, and there's no industrial demand for these bitcoins. So industries have got to basically wake up and well, we can wake up. But I mean, companies have got to look at ways to innovate around bitcoin, not for the sake of bitcoin, but because bitcoin itself is a really interesting technology. And when we look at this model, we can reduce the cost of transaction, we can reduce the cost of fraud, there's so many benefits, better consumer experiences. We can do all these things using the blockchain and using Bitcoin. There's no reason why we shouldn't be pushing the envelope yet. It's going to take a while, it's going to take a couple of years, but, and, and we're not the only ones doing this. There are companies doing it, but this is what needs to happen at scale. We need multiple industries, multiple billion dollar industries using Bitcoin for it to become more, more stable in terms of, well, I say stable, more respected. Um, and and this, this sort of flows into my next point. I think you know, that we've all discussed, and Harry was up here um, earlier on, we've all discussed about where, you know, the Bitcoin price and where Bitcoin is going to. But the, the real issue here is that the Bitcoin, Bitcoin as a currency is not viable right now for a whole bunch of reasons, mainly because I think it's just not consumer friendly. Um, and it's just too volatile. It just is. People do not want to hold Bitcoins. I mean, you know, the Bitcoin, true Bitcoin loyalists, I mean, I'm, I'm taking one of them because I, I love Bitcoin, I have Bitcoin, etc. But it, I can't put a million dollars into Bitcoin knowing that tomorrow it could be worth 500, the next day it could be worth 1.2. Like, the volatility is just too high even for, and even for people who are uh, with small amounts of Bitcoin, people, some people can't afford to have $5,000 in Bitcoin, knowing it can only be worth three and a half thousand the next day, they, they, you can't live like that, right? It's just too volatile, and but the volatility comes from the lack of liquidity. So the, the marketplace, the Bitcoin um, uh, market cap's four billion right now. If that market cap was eighty billion, what would it look like? Okay, so if Bitcoin was worth four thousand dollars a coin, it's a, there's a lot more forces on either side, buy and sell, keeping it stable. So it's the same as penny stocks. Penny stocks are way more volatile than blue chip companies. We need Bitcoin to become like a blue chip. It needs to become a $5,000, $10,000, $15,000 uh, uh, asset, a, a real true commodity. It's the world's first digital commodity, okay? It's, it's a commodity because they're all, you know, they're all homogenous. They're all, it's all the same, basically, and there's limited supply. There's 21 million, that's it. So it needs to get to a settling point where there's enough demand on the industrial side and there's enough buying. Basically, you want buyers and sellers on both sides for, forcing the price to go up because of market needs. Um, and that's the point, I think, where we can start looking at Bitcoin as a real currency as such, because not, then governments can go base there, you know, they can store Bitcoins in their vaults, in theory, and print money around it, whatever. But right now, it's just too volatile for that. Anything else? We're good? Thank you, Thanks, guys.